In this lesson, we're going to be using the zero product property, factoring polynomials using the greatest common factor, and using the zero product property to solve real life problems. A polynomial is in factored form when it is written as a product of factors. So here we have our standard form version of the polynomial, and the factored form, we just factored out an x here. And then here, the standard form of x squared plus 5x minus 24 is x minus 3, that quantity, times the quantity x plus 8. And if you FOIL this out, you'll get this. When one side of an equation is a polynomial in factored form, and the other side is zero, use the zero product property to solve the polynomial equation. The solutions of a polynomial equation are also called roots. So I'm gonna scroll down here for the zero product property. If the product of two real numbers is zero, then at least one of the numbers is zero. So in algebra, if a and b are real numbers, and a times b equals zero, then a equals zero, or b equals zero. So at least one of these has to be zero. So we could either do zero times zero, zero times b, or a times zero. Any of that would uh, make that equation true. So in this example, we're gonna be solving the equations. Well, for part a, I have two x times the quantity x minus four equals zero. Well, this is an example where I can use my zero product property, okay? Well, I have something times something else, and that's gonna equal zero. So that means that at least one of these things has to be equal to zero. So I'm gonna break this up into two x is gonna either equal zero, or x minus four is gonna equal zero. And then I just have to solve these equations to find my x values. So here I can either divide by two on both sides to get zero for x, or you can just think what number times two is equal to zero, that has to be zero, okay? So x equals zero is one of my solutions, or, and then here all I have to do is add four on both sides, and I get x equals four. So I could write it like this, or I could write my values like this, x equals zero, four. Uh, either this way or this way will work. And using our vocab term, one way we could say this is that zero and four are the roots of this equation. For part B, I'm gonna do the same thing. So I'm gonna zoom in here. So I get x minus three, this quantity is being multiplied by the quantity x minus nine. So this thing times this thing equals zero, at least one of these has to be zero. So I'm gonna rewrite this as x minus three equals zero or x minus nine equals zero. Okay, and then I'm just gonna solve these equations. So if I add three, I get x equals three, or if I add nine, I get x equals nine. Once again, I can write it like this, or I can write x equals three comma nine. Okay, so my x values that make this equation true are three and nine, and now we're done. When two or more roots of an equation are the same number, the equation has repeated roots. So for example, two, we're gonna solve each equation, and we're actually gonna see an example that has repeated roots. So for part A, I have 2x plus 7 times the quantity 2x minus 7 equals 0. Well, I'm just going to set this 2x plus 7 equals 0. I'm going to zoom in a little bit, write a better 0. And then or 2x minus 7 equals 0. Okay, well, I'm going to solve the equation on the left first. Subtract 7. I get 2x equals negative 7. Then divide 2. I get x equals negative seven over two as one of my values. If I solve this equation, I would add seven on both sides. So I get two x equals seven. Then I'd divide by two right here. So I get divide two. I'd get x equals seven halves. Okay, you could write this as 3.5 or three and one half, but I'm gonna leave it um, as an improper fraction for now. Okay, so I could write it like this. I could also write it like x equals negative seven halves comma seven halves. I forgot my or up here. And I could also write it in a special way because I have uh, a number and it's opposite. So I can actually write this as x equals plus or minus seven halves. Okay, and you'll see that later in this course. Anyway, we're done with part A. Now I'm gonna move on to part B. So I have the equation x minus one quantity squared equals zero. Well, I'm just gonna write this out. This is x minus one times x minus one equals zero. Uh, so if I was gonna write my two equations to solve this using the zero product property, I'd write x minus one equals zero 
or x minus 1 equals 0. And notice they're the same equation, so I'm going to get the same answer if I add 1 on both sides. I'm going to get x equals 1 or x equals 1 for both of them. This is an example of repeated roots. Okay, So 1 would be a repeated root. So what you could say is x equals 1, and that's the only value that will make this equation true. So now we're done with part B. Part C, I'm just going to kind of give ourselves some more space. I have x plus 1, that quantity, times x minus 3, times the quantity x minus 2. Okay. Well, there's more than two things being multiplied, but that's okay. I'm just going to set all of them equal to 0. So this x plus 1 factor, this x minus 3 factor, and this x minus 2. So I get x plus 1 equals 0, or x minus 3 equals 0, or x minus 2 equals 0. Okay, now I'm just going to solve all these equations. Minus 1, add 3, add 2. So I get x equals negative 1, or x equals 3, or x equals 2. So these are my x values. And I could also write it like x equals negative 1, 2, 3, like this. Okay. So we've successfully solved all these equations using the zero product property, and now we're done. Factoring polynomials using the greatest common factor. To solve a polynomial equation using the zero product property, you may need to factor out the polynomial or write it as a product of other polynomials. Look for the greatest common factor, or the GCF, of the terms of the polynomial. This is a monomial that divides evenly into each term. So for example 3, we're going to factor out the greatest common monomial factor from 4x to the 4th power plus 24x cubed. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in here. Well, in order to factor this out, I often like to use what I call the ladder method. So I'm going to write 4x to the 4th and then plus 24x cubed. Okay, and then I want to see what I can factor out here. Now you can tell right away if you want. Um, what the greatest common factor is going to be, or you can factor things out at different steps, okay? And I'll do both. So right here, I can get a 4 out of the 4 and the 24, okay? So if I do that, I get a 4, and then I get an x to the 4th is left over, plus 6x cubed, okay? Now I'm going to make another step in my ladder, and I have x to the 4th power and 6x cubed. Well, this has 4x's being multiplied. This has 3x's that are being multiplied. So I know I can take out at least 3x's that are being multiplied. So I get x cubed, and what I have left, just x here, because I took three of them away. And then plus, well, I took the x cubed away, so now I just have six, okay? So now what I have is x plus six is gonna be left over, and then my greatest common factor is just if I multiply this and this. Well, I have a 4 and an x cubed. Okay, So this is going to turn into 4x cubed times the quantity. Well, x plus 6 is left over, so this is going to be x plus 6. All right, so this ladder method right here isn't really going to be necessary, but this is kind of why it works, and it could help you, uh, especially as you're starting out. But uh, if you don't want to use that, that's totally fine. I'll show you that we can just kind of do that without making that ladder. So if I had 4x to the 4th plus 24x cubed, I can kind of just look at each term and say, okay, what is the number greatest common factor and what's the variable greatest common factor? Well, the number greatest common factor is going to be 4, and this has an x cubed, this has an x to the 4th. Whatever the lower exponent is, we can factor that out. Um, and I'm going to get 4x cubed. And then I just want to see, okay, 4x cubed times what is x to the 4th? That's going to be x plus 4x cubed times what equals 24x cubed? Well, that's just going to be 6 because 6 times 4 is 24, and then I just bring my x cubed term over. Okay, so this is our final answer. It doesn't matter which way you get it. Um, the way I did it second is probably quicker, but the latter method um, can help you out just as you're getting started with problems like these. Anyway, now we're done with this one. For example 4, we're going to solve some equations by factoring. So for part A, I need to solve 2x squared plus 8x equals 0. All right. So what I want to do is factor out the GCF, greatest common factor. Uh, and I can see right here from these two terms, I can factor out a 2 because they're both even. And then I can factor out an x because this has an x and this has an x squared. So I can factor out an x. And then what's left after I factor out, or you can think of it as dividing out this 2x term, 
it's just gonna be an x here because 2x times x is 2x squared. And then right here, I'm just gonna have four because four times 2x gives me 8x. So now I have a factored polynomial equation and I can solve this using the zero product property. So I have 2x and x plus four. So I'm gonna set 2x equal to zero and then x plus four equal to zero. If I solve this, well, you, if you remember, we did this earlier, this is just gonna be x equals zero. You could divide by two on both sides or you could just tell, well, two times zero is gonna be zero. So that's my only x value for this one. Or I have x plus four. Well, if I subtract four, I get x equals negative four. Okay, and once again, you can write it like this, x equals negative four comma zero. So now we're done with part A. For part B, I have 6n squared equals 15n. This one might be a little bit trickier, and I'm gonna put some space in between that. Um, and the reason is because we might wanna say, oh, if I divide n, that would cancel out at least one of the n's, but we never wanna divide by a variable. We'd always rather factor, because uh, we might miss some values if we end up dividing by a variable. So what I wanna do is I wanna get all my terms on one side and set them equal to zero, so I can hopefully use my zero product property. So if I subtract 15n on both sides, I get 6n squared minus 15n, and then this just cancels. Remember, canceling with addition and subtraction is zero. So now I have 6n squared minus 15n equals zero, and now I can find my greatest common factor to factor out, and then I can use my zero product property, okay? So I have a six and a 15. I know I can factor out a three here, and then I have an n and an n squared, so I can factor out an n there, and what's left is just gonna be 2n right here because 3n times 2n is 6n squared. And then this is gonna be negative. So I do 3n times negative five, I get negative 15n. Okay, and if you're not sure, you can just distribute this out and see if it matches. Anyway, now I have two things that are being multiplied by each other that are equal to zero. I have 3n times the quantity 2n minus five. So I can set these both equal to zero uh, by using my zero product property. So 3n equals zero, or 2n minus five equals zero. Now I can divide this equation by three, or you could have just been able to tell that n is gonna equal zero here. Or if I add five here, and I get 2n equals five, then I divide two, I get n equals five halves, 2.5 or two and one half, doesn't matter which way you write it. Anyway, I could write my answer like this n equals zero comma two and one half. I'm just gonna do a mixed number here. You could have written five halves, that would have been fine too. Anyway, I've successfully solved my equations by factoring first and then using the zero product property, and now we're done with this one. For example, five, you can model the arch of a fireplace using the equation y equals negative one ninth times quantity x plus 18 times quantity x minus 18, where x and y are measured in inches. The x-axis represents the floor find the width of the arch at floor level. So what I'm trying to find is basically just how wide this fireplace is at the floor level, and we're treating the x-axis as floor level, okay? So I just basically need to find the distance between here and here. The problem is, I don't know what the exact value is between here and here by just looking at the graph. So I need to solve for that, okay? And what I'm gonna do is actually use the fact that I know that this floor is the x-axis, because so I know that the x-axis right here is when y equals zero, okay? So to find what this x value is, and this x value is, I can just set my y value equal to zero. So I'm gonna rewrite this equation, but y is gonna be equal to zero, once again, because of the x-axis is when y is zero. So I'm gonna rewrite zero equals negative one ninth times x plus 18 times x minus 18. And now I'm gonna solve this. Well, I have a number that's being multiplied here, but if you see, I can just get rid of this because if I multiply both sides of this equation by the reciprocal of this, which is gonna be negative nine, to cancel that out, negative nine on both sides. Well, negative nine times zero just stays zero. And then this negative nine and this negative one ninth just cancel. So all I have left now is x plus 18 times x minus 18 in parentheses. Okay, and now I can use my zero product property. So I'm gonna set x plus 18 equal to zero, and I'm gonna set x minus 18 equal to zero. And if I subtract 18 here, 
I get x equals negative 18. So that's one of my x values. And then if I have adding 18 here, I should say, I get x equals positive 18. So I know my two x values are going to be negative 18 and positive 18. If we look at the graph, that just means that where this curve crosses the x axis is just going to be at x equals negative 18, which is going to be here because it's the negative part. It's going to be negative 18. And then this one is going to be positive 18. Now this curve is called a parabola. We're going to talk a lot about parabolas upcoming in this course. Anyway, if we go back to the question, what I need to do is I need to find the width of the arch at floor level. Okay. Well, now I know where the fireplace stops. It's going to be at 18 and negative 18. So I just need to find the distance between negative 18 and 18. So what I can do is just take 18 and then minus negative 18, just figure out what this distance is going to be. So that's going to be 18 minus negative 18. And that's going to become 36. Okay. Remember, distance is always going to be positive. So if you started here, did negative 18 minus 18, you'd have to take the absolute value here. So I know my value is going to be 36. I just want to check my units. I see that we're measured in inches. So this is going to be 36 inches for my width or 3 feet. Okay, so I know that the width of this is going to be 36 inches or 3 feet. And I believe that's the only thing that we need to answer. Find the width. Yep, that's it. So now we're done with this one.